Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're here for our regular family workshop series, but we are really in for a treat tonight because we've got Dr. Kerry Magro with us. And it's been a couple of years since he's been able to join us and talk about his experience uh, growing up with autism and his work as an, an advocate and a motivational speaker. I'm going to take a minute and read you his voluminous uh, biography. And this is only, I, I think, a, a smattering of what he brings to the table. So uh, Dr. Kerry Magro, EDD, is an award-winning autistic professional speaker, best-selling author, and autistic consultant to the HBO series Mrs. Fletcher that aired in fall 2019, and for the latest season of Netflix Emmy award-winning series Love on the Spectrum. You know how we love that show here. He started professionally speaking 11 years ago via the National Speakers Association after he fell in love with theater as a child to help with his social and communication skills. Today, he has spoken at over 1,150 events during, the during this time, including two TEDx talks and a talks at Google presentation. In addition, Carrie is CEO and president of KFM Making a Difference, a nonprofit organization that hosts inclusion events and has provided 100 scholarships for students with autism for college and counting since 2011. In his spare time, he hosts a Facebook page called Carrie's Autism Journey. On Facebook, he does on-camera interviews highlighting people impacted by a diagnosis to break down barriers in our community. And the videos he's produced have been watched over 35 million times. He also has best-selling books, Defining Autism from the Heart and Autism and Falling in Love, I Will Light It Up Blue, and his latest, Autistics on Autism. And they've reached the Amazon best-selling list for special needs parenting. He is based in Hoboken, New Jersey. So thank you for joining us tonight and welcome. And I'm so glad to be here with the St. Louis Arc. I believe that they are one of the greatest champions in our community. I've known their organization for many years now, and they're doing some incredible work to help the disability community. So at the end of today's presentation, not only will I be sharing my list of free autism resources, I often share with parents and educators, but if you scan the QR code at the end, I'll make sure that you receive the PowerPoint slide notes from tonight's presentation, just so you don't miss anything. Uh, along my journey, uh, I grew up with two laser-focused key interests. I grew up wanting to be the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys, and I grew up wanting to be the next Larry Bird. So I took my key interests and talents and tried to turn them into careers. I received a degree in sport management, at Seton Hall University before deciding to change career paths, realizing that there were many individuals with disabilities being underserved within our communities and wanting to do something to support them because I really didn't have those peer mentors growing up who I could look up to. So I decided to get a master's in strategic communication so I could become one of the first professionally certified public speakers who is autistic in the United States. It's given us the opportunity to travel the globe in the past 12 years, get to speak in schools, colleges, government organizations, nonprofits, companies about hiring people who are neurodiverse in the workplace and so many more incredible groups. Along the way, we've written four books based on uh, different topics impacting the autism community. We're writing a book called Defining Autism from the Heart about self-advocacy, autism and falling in love about relationships for those on the spectrum. I Will Light Up Blue, a children's book focused on two autistic children who learn about their diagnosis and advocate for themselves. And then our latest book, Autistics on Autism. Uh, which is focused on 100 stories of individuals with autism growing up and pursuing a post-secondary education. Along the way, I took my love of theater to also work as an autism consultant to bring a realistic portrayal of autism to every screen in our communities, whether it be television or film. And it's given me the opportunity to work on Warner Brothers' Joyful Noise with uh, Queen Latifah and Dolly Parton based on one of the characters in this film having an autism diagnosis and me sharing my personal journey of growing up in the hopes that we could really focus on representation mattering in our society. Later getting the opportunity to work on films like Jane Wants a Boyfriend, which focuses on a 25-year-old girl with autism trying to find love in New York City. 
HBO's limited series, Mrs. Fletcher, which had a reoccurring character in that series who had autism. And then also the most recent season of the Emmy Award winning Netflix series, Love on the Spectrum US, which I'm so thrilled to say uh, has now been renewed for season two. So get excited for that. It's a fantastic, fantastic show that helps make sure that people understand how some people with autism navigate trying to find meaningful relationships today in our community. Along the way, in addition to that, we're receiving a credit in an upcoming film called Inappropriate Behavior with Robert De Niro and Bobby Carnival, where one of the characters in the film has an autism diagnosis. And hopefully later in the year, The Present, which is a movie that features Greg Kinnear uh, from Little Miss Sunshine and Isla Fisher from Wedding Crashers, where one of the characters in the film has autism and communicates via an augmented alternative communication device. We're actually really excited about that because we need more stories about people who are not speaking in our mainstream media because often it kind of revolves around a lot of savants and it's still stereotypically, I think, in, in my opinion, still focuses way too much on those Rain Man stories and those good doctor stories. And one of the messages I often share uh, as part of our presentations is that if you met one individual with autism, you met just that one individual with autism. Dr. Sidney Shark quoted that and it's a remarkable and amazing person who I am happy to say I can call a friend today. Uh, along the journey, I realized that I wanted to give back, though. I was blessed with the opportunity to make this into a full-time career. So I started a nonprofit organization that I do on the side where I don't receive a paycheck as part of this nonprofit. It's simply just me wanting to try to give back to a community that has already given me so much. So I started a few initiatives like a scholarship program where we've given out 130 scholarships for autistic students to pursue a post-secondary education in the last nine years, in addition to giving out 25 small business grants for small businesses that hire people with disabilities. One thing that I continue to see as a true challenge in our community is the unemployment rate of those with not only autism, but those with disabilities. And we need to tap into this untapped talent pool. Along the way, we also work with our first responders in the hopes of helping them inter know, knowing how to interact with people who have autism and other disabilities. There are still so many people in our community who are prone to wandering and going missing as a result because of that wandering. And we need to do a better job of helping not only our first responders, but our communities understand a little bit more about, for example, that some individuals with autism are prone to water that they are prone to highways and being able to understand where somebody might actually be navigating if they are in a wandering situation. Along with uh, the roles that I serve in the film and entertainment world, I also get the opportunity to wear many hats in the autism community, serving on the board of directors for the National Autism Association, uh, Autism Society of America, Autism on the Seas, and in addition to that, being on the board member for a continuing uh, education group that do certified autism centers. Uh, one of their coolest ones that we've got an opportunity to highlight is Sesame Place, where they've actually had to train 80% of their employees on how to interact with those with autism and sensory processing disorders. Along the way, we also worked on the social media campaign for the first season of The Good Doctor on ABC focus on Dr. Sean Murphy, a surgeon who's on the autism spectrum, and then also the first season of Atypical on Netflix, which focuses on Sam Garner, an 18-year-old with autism who's trying to get into a relationship but also succeed in post-secondary. If I leave you with anything tonight, it's that when we talk about autism, especially during the month of April, we make sure that people realize that autism has no look. Uh, typically people come up to me and they say, Carrie, you have autism, but you don't look like you have autism. And then Carrie, you have autism, but you look so normal. We need to normalize that some individuals in our community might have an invisible disability. But while some individuals do have that invisible disability, it doesn't mean that they don't necessarily go through challenges in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, in addition to that, uh, one other message I hope I can leave you with tonight is the importance of siblings. 
we, we often talk in our schools about the importance of an early diagnosis, but then we also talk about the fact that we should be telling our kids about their diagnoses at earlier ages so they can self-advocate for themselves. I like to take it one step further though and talk about the importance of siblings advocating because siblings can have such a huge, huge role. And a great children's book to help with that education early on is a book called What About Me? It's a book by and for an autis autism sibling. It was actually written by a 10 year old who has a brother who's on the autism spectrum. In addition, if you're trying to become a sibling advocate, I would definitely recommend looking at the Autism Society of America's website because they actually have sibling scholarships for individuals who want to go about advocating for our communities. So my diagnosis, I was diagnosed with autism in a time when the numbers of autism were one in every 1,000 being diagnosed. And today, autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disabilities, I believe impacting now one in 36 or one in 34. Uh, it's been a long day, I need some coffee, in the United States, uh, where we still see that boys are diagnosed four times more often than girls. And we need to have larger conversations about girl autism in our communities as well. But uh, once I started talking, like the Fox 5 video mentioned, you couldn't give me a stop talking. Most of my challenges growing up were sensory processing related. I always had a hypersensitivity when it came to bright lights, loud noises, and I was definitely afraid of bell sirens. I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey before moving to Hoboken, New Jersey seven years ago. So I've lived in New Jersey my entire life in big cities where there's a lot of sensory stimulation coming from a wide range of areas. Some of the best ways that I coped was stimming, which is also known as self-simulatory behavior, where often as a kid growing up, I would spin in circles as a way of coming back to a place of normalcy. I would also use a sensory brush that was basically the size of the palm of my hand to come back to a place of normalcy whenever I felt a certain trigger uh, coming about. That was actually something my occupational therapist helped me with tremendously to help me overcome many of my sensory related challenges. And then I learned about my diagnosis uh, when I was 11 and a half years old. I learned about my diagnosis and autism for the first time playing disability celebrity bingo when I was 11 and a half in a social skills class where we were learning that individuals like Michael Jordan were diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, Magic Johnson, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and uh, as a basketball fan and a huge Laker fan, understanding that some of the most successful people in our community had disabilities, I was curious. So I asked my teacher, so you said all these individuals are special, so why am I special? And that was the first time she said that I need to talk to my parents about that. So I sat my parents down right after school that day, and that was the first time they ever told me I had autism. And, you know, I was 11 and a half years old. I really didn't have any follow-up questions. I went to go watch magic school bus reruns in my house. But years later, I would sit down at a computer and I would research autism and I would learn more about my strengths and challenges. And for years that I didn't know why I was special, it was so life-changing to finally have that conversation with my parents. I believe that we should start the diagnosis conversations if they're developmentally ready at as early as five years old, to give them an opportunity to sit in on their IEP meetings and learn a little bit more about their strengths and then also accommodations that they receive. So hopefully one day they can become their best self-advocates once they reach adulthood. And sometimes they get pushback when I, say that when I tell this to parents because they say that they don't want their child to be defined by a label and use their disability as a crutch. And when those conversations come, I typically say that that is when we give individuals those positive peer role models to look up to. For example, Dan Aykroyd, who was on the last slide. Dan Aykroyd grew up with two laser focused key interests. He grew up wanting to become a crime detective and he wanted to grow up to become a ghost hunter. And then he came out with Ghostbusters. And years later, he would contribute his autism diagnosis to the reason why he was able to come up with that script. So we need to not only highlight the spectrum, but realize that some people with disabilities are truly capable of incredible things. So in addition to that, we should never hide, especially if somebody's not developmentally ready to hear about their diagnosis. I always definitely recommend, uh, I, have a, I have a webinar uh, that's about 30 minutes long where I discuss how to talk to a child about their autism diagnosis for the first time on my website, carriemagro.com. 
I always recommend an entertainment element though, as a way of having that conversation, having the ability to watch, for example, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which has a character in that show who has autism and sharing a little bit about the signs of autism in the hopes that a child may have that aha moment where they realize that, wow, I have a lot of similar characteristics as this individual. It's just an easy way of starting those initial conversations. In addition to that, Hero Elementary uh, is about a superhero who's on the autism spectrum. And then one of my favorites, Sesame Street. Julia was the first Muppet to ever appear on Sesame Street who had an autism diagnosis. As we continue to learn more about autism, though, we're realizing that some individuals are diagnosed now in adulthood. We have a great example of uh, Elon Musk eight, about 18 months ago on Saturday Night Live told the world that he was on the autism spectrum, one of the first people to ever host SNL who had autism. And there, ironically enough, have been a lot of adults who have gone to seek diagnoses after their child's initial diagnosis. You would be shocked how many parents have seen their ch children growing up in school and receiving an IEP and seeing similar quirks and then wanting to go about that initial diagnosis. We're seeing a lot of parents actually going and finding out about their diagnoses after their child was diagnosed. Uh, so there's some great shows to help you, especially when it comes to adult autism and having a better understanding, such as atypical, but then also another great one as we see it, which unfortunately I canceled after the first season. I'm shocked. I can't believe it did. Uh, but it focuses on three uh, individuals in their mid-20s who uh, actually uh, are, are living with an aid and living uh, by themselves uh, for the first time. So what my parents did for my journey from non-speaking to professional speaker, I mean, there were some really important things that they wanted to do. And the first one was they wanted to roll out as many associated medical and health conditions as humanly possible. Uh, they found out because of that, that I had dysgraphia, which is a handwriting disorder, which was due to my fine motor challenges because of my autism diagnosis. I always recommend talking to your child's pediatrician at earlier ages about any signs that you see. Going to scales like the MCHAT model and being able to assess what your child's specific challenges are. Are they having challenges with babbling? Uh, which could be a sign of other challenges with things like apraxia, where they might not have the muscles in their throat to even make sounds, where somebody who is nonverbal might be the might be a difference between somebody who's not speaking. And uh, other diagnoses that I often see uh, somebody dual diagnosed with, in addition to autism, include but are not limited to attention deficit disorder, ADHD, anxiety, depression, epilepsy, apraxia, ecophilia, and so many more different diagnoses in our community. What my parents also did early on was they brushed up on the Individualized Disability Education Act, and they also figured out what advocates were and how they could go about hiring an advocate to help with my IEP process. This was something that was really pivotal towards some of my early learning. But in addition to that, also researching websites like the American Speech, Language and Hearing Association, where they found out that there are insurance mandates for autism spectrum disorders. Uh, at, at the beginning, it wasn't in all 50 states, but slowly trickled up to provide uh, min minimal services, but hopefully more services in the future for our autism community. Another key tip, which was helpful for them, was understanding that they couldn't do this alone. I was a child who had emotional aggression. I had challenging behaviors for most of my adolescence because when you can't communicate with the people you care about the most in this world, even about some of your basic needs, it gets really, really tough at times. And I know that because I literally dealt with that day to day, uh, especially when I was a really, really young child. And being able to rely on others, we often say in the autism world is that it takes a village. So I hope anyone tuning in tonight realizes that there are people in our community who want to support you and help you. People like the, the wonderful people who I've gotten to know at St. Louis Arc, among other people such as organizations like the National Mentoring Resource Center who actually start conversations about mentors 
for yourself, for those newly diagnosed parents to help them through this process. I would definitely recommend checking out that link for more information. In addition to that, what my parents also did early on was they realized the importance of social skills. Now, a common question I get from parents, I receive about 100, 125 questions a day, literally a day, from parents, educators, therapists, government officials. And typically a question they, they, they talk to me about is my child is having challenges in standardized testing and I'm really, really struggling there. I don't think necessarily Common Core is the answer for every single one of our students. It's so, so pivotal that when we're talking about children with autism that we're meeting them where they are in their development. We give staff developments with educators around the globe. And one of the things that we constantly say is teach the way they learn, whether that's including more social skills as part of their IEP process, being able to have assistive technology devices available for them like ProLocal to go, especially those who are minimally verbal as well. We need to really meet them where they are in their development. Uh, social skills was pivotal for me. Uh, and in that, one of the things that my parents always try to do was try to make goals observable and measurable. And regardless if your child needs help with social skills training, this is just something that helps across the board when it comes to helping somebody develop who's on the autism spectrum, such as I will greet my peers at least twice a week during group activities, or instead of writing notes, I will ask my teacher for help when I don't understand a situation at least once a week. This not only helped me build on my social skills, but it also helped me build on my self-advocacy too. So I produced a video webinar series that we talked a little bit about earlier uh, when we talked about uh, having a child um, learn a little bit about their diagnosis. We've also done ones on picky eating, nonverbal autism, dating, succeeding in school with a learning disability, and others as well. And another message that my parents really strived on from my journey from non-speaking to professional speaker was the importance of realizing that the key is communication, not speech. We as a society need to do a better job because this is another common question I get from parents. They ask me, when will my child speak for the first time? And I asked them, well, what have you done in the realms of the sounds they're making? Have you mimicked their sounds? Have you looked at assistive technology devices? Have you looked to text-to-speech devices? Is your child a kinetic learner? And have you considered American Sign Language? There are so many different avenues that you should consider before just saying, will my child ever speak? Instead, change the conversation to, will my child communicate? And how do they communicate in their own right? Because every single child and adult is different in the way they communicate. And then also some students will in the future prefer either person first or identity first language. And we've given a wide range of talks with companies, especially on this topic, because we know it's so, so important, especially with the autistic advocates we mentor. We realize that while some individuals in school were always taught to put the person before their diagnosis, there are some individuals who find validation by be calling an autistic person because they consider their autism an integral part of who they are. And that's really a big part of the neurodiversity movement that we are currently seeing not only in the United States, but across the globe. In addition to that, I always say to try to avoid functioning labels as well especially uh, only necessarily when it comes to receiving accommodations, because there are some diagnosticians who will say that a child was diagnosed with high functioning or low functioning autism versus there's three different levels of autism now as part of the DSM-5 called level one autism, level two autism, level three autism. It's just really important that for myself, I may be considered high functioning right now, but after I get off this call, I don't know necessarily if I'm going to need four or five hours to recharge afterwards. And the next day, I might not necessarily have the ability to speak for long periods of time and might be considered quote unquote low functioning in those aspects. Even my sensory challenges to this day would not necessarily be considered high functioning. So, you know, from this journey, I've spent the past 31 years of my life, my parents have had the realization that I finally had this diagnosis of PDD and OS. And I often talk to my parents about what's one thing that I, I wish 
or, or, or they wish they could have done to help me. And I think there's a whole aspect of the deficit model that has been a theme for them where sometimes it felt like they focus 99.9% .9 of the time on what I couldn't do. But what were we doing to focus and nurture strengths? So I like to say that autism can't define me and I define autism. And I can only hope that each one of you who have decided to join us this evening can go out there, define your lives and your journeys in the way that you best see it every single day. And if you need any help getting started in those conversations, these are the ways that you can stay in contact with me after tonight's presentation. I thank you all so much. As some housekeeping notes, this is the QR code where you can get the PowerPoint slide notes from tonight's presentation in addition to the list of free autism resources I promised. And I'd love to answer any questions you have at this time. Thanks again. Wow, you covered a lot of stuff during that opening presentation. I, I really appreciated so much of what you said. And I think it's important for everybody that's listening to hear you say that even though right in the moment you are a rock star, that there's there's a toll that takes that you have to accommodate that as well. And, and, and I, I think it's nice for people to realize that just what you see on the screen may not be the same minute to minute. So thank you for being uh, open about that. We do have quite a few questions, some pre-submitted and some that people uh, came up with while you were talking. And I think I wanna cluster them around certain topics. So are we, can we start with employment? Um, we've got a lot of questions just about what are some ways I can help myself as a person with autism to be better prepared for a job? What are some things that you'd like employers to know? I, I mean, from, from the self-advocate perspective, one of the things that I always recommend is doing role playing. I, I definitely think that it's important that you find a loved one. Uh, who can help you go through the interview process because that's often a, a barrier to entry for autistic adults because of the challenges of not knowing necessarily what to expect. So being able to do mock interviews and ask questions uh, about potential jobs that they may receive in the future is really, really key. Uh, then also just doing your homework, especially going on websites like Glassdoor and Monster.com and seeing if the company that you might be looking to be hired in has a previous history of hiring people with disabilities. It just makes a lot of sense, especially if you know that you have challenges that might be on the surface that you might feel like you might be discriminated because of. It just makes sense to see somebody who's inclusive overall. Uh, you can definitely look up groups like there's a diversity equality index that's available on dol.gov, which helps individuals understand what some companies' DEI practices are, uh, especially in our community today. Thank you. Uh, kind of as a, a follow-up to that, I think it's often a challenge for people to know how to disclose a disability and how to talk about accommodations. Um, what are some of your suggestions about that? Well, when we talk about dis the disclosure, one of the things that we need to highlight is that you never have to tell somebody that you're autistic in the process of receiving accommodations. And I feel like that's an area where a lot of people get confused. We were just talking with SP Global the other day for professional development for their company for Autism Acceptance Month. And one of the things that we highlighted was the fact that when we talk about reasonable accommodations, it's providing human resources or their supervisor with the ability to understand why the accommodation is needed, not necessarily what specific diagnosis they have. All they need to do is share that they have a disclosed disability and these are the accommodations they need to receive. Me, for example, though, I rarely received any accommodations. My only accommodation I had was in two jo different jobs, and that was written instructions uh, to, for clarity in, in the workplace. So realize that you don't necessarily even have to if you are in no need of accommodations, but understanding that you don't have to go into great detail makes it a lot less in intimidating that I see with, with many of the mentees I work with. There's a few other questions about employment, but I'm gonna jump over because I'm uh, interested in talking about relationships. <laughs> and, and you said that that was one of your life goals was to fall in love. Where, where are things with your life socially right now? 
I'm currently dating somebody and uh, we're boyfriend and girlfriend and we will see where it goes. I'm uh, really just excited to see what happens there. Um, and yeah, we'll just see how the future goes. Uh, I, I am really thrilled though to have been able to work on shows like Love on the Spectrum. Uh, Cause when we talk about adult related topics I feel like there's a lot of a lot of limited resources. We see a lot of resources on employment, housing, post-secondary, and guardianship. But then I feel like relationships fall through the cracks way too often. So for anyone watching out there, let's just continue to promote uh, dating resources because these kids do want to be in relationships. And when they turn adults, we need to be ready for that. Yeah, I think one of the things I've found most intriguing about Love on the Spectrum is the skill building that people work through, but also their comfort level with trying over and over again. I think that's a universal fear of rejection is a universal challenge. So for everybody that's kind of thinking about trying the dating world, do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is realizing that rejection happens to everyone. This is something that we talk a lot about in our book, uh, Autism and Falling in Love, because when you really understand and are able to grasp the five stages of grief and are able to understand why things happen the way they do, it makes, again, we, we, we live in a world where autism is often focused a lot on structure. So being able to have that preparation beforehand can be really, really helpful to not only being brave enough because, you know, dating in 2023 is, is weird. <laughs> it's very, very bizarre at times, especially in our world with online apps, Bumble, Tinder, Coffee Meets Bagel, and then in addition to that, hookup culture, which continues to be an area where a lot of kids I work with have struggles with, not understanding necessarily the mo the the ideas that a other person might have. It's like, if we're hand-holding, does that mean we're in a relationship, or does that just mean we're looking for levels of intimacy? So, Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to navigate for anybody. Something that comes up a lot for our advocates, and one of them submitted a question here is, how can I date and have the relationships I want if I have to ask my guardian for approval for each person I socialize with? And I think there's a bigger question in there about your ability to advocate for yourself when maybe you've got some legal uh, barriers. Yeah, I... Yeah. You know, it's funny, I, I, I don't mean to be stereotypical at all, but there's there's been so much talk about conservatorships and I'm a pop culture guy. I already told you I wanted to be the Backstreet Boy when I grew up. So I mean, the whole Britney Spears conservatorship led to a lot of the conversations that I heard in the disability community, especially with people uh, trying to go about advocating for themselves and sometimes having barriers, especially in terms of the guardianship uh, process. So. I, I think it's just important to know your rights and be able to have open and honest conversations with those potential guardians about how you're feeling uh, and just you know ask questions when, when you're unsure about something. Uh, and any suggestions on where people might go out to meet a potential partner? Uh, <laughs> great question, not bars, definitely not, not bars. bars, okay. Uh, I would definitely not recommend that. Uh, in, in, in terms of things that I could recommend, I mean, one, one of the first things that I would recommend is definitely consider online dating apps. I mean, I, I've seen some success there because it helps individuals be able to prepare what they're going to say before they're going to say it. And it's less of having to have really good eye contact and focus on active listening. It's, it, it's a lot easier from that mm -hmm. perspective. Um, but in addition to that, I mean, there are dating apps that are available for autistic people in our community today. Again, always take them with a grain of salt, always do your research, but there's an app called Hickey, which is H-I-K-I, which focuses on, it's an app for iOS and Android, uh, which focuses on people who are on the autism spectrum dating and finding meaningful friendships too. So there are avenues out there, especially as we have seen the prevalence increase in autism in our communities. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck with this relationship. I know it's going to go be wonderful. 
Uh, I'm gonna skip again now and talk, I wanna talk a little bit about some mental health kinds of things, um, but you mentioned in your presentation that you've done presentations for first responders. And I know that for a lot of our families, uh, the combination of communication challenges, sensory issues and potential corresponding mental health issues really creates a lot of anxiety. Uh, for families and for individuals with that interaction they might have with the police. And I, I guess, what do you think is the most important information you share with police departments? And do you have any recommendations for uh, individuals and families who might have an expectation that they'll have an interaction with the police? Yeah, uh, well, one of the things we talk most with first responders about is we, we we often work with police officers more often than most emergency responders. But one of the things we, we do is how to approach, because often if somebody's in an emergency situation, you don't know what potential situation they're going to be in. You may see them stimming and you may question to yourself whether they are on drugs or if something else is going on. So the importance of just asking questions and then also making sure that if there's any potential family members nearby in a situation to make sure to get as many opinions as you can before, if you, especially if you see somebody who's having a really, really challenging time. That's first and foremost what we try to recommend. And then secondly, I mean, preparation is key. I mean, reaching out to groups like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, being able to go to your local precinct and actually file that your child has a diagnosed disability can help those officers understand a little bit more about an individual with a disability. Uh, so that's another key area that we, we often recommend to our police officers to have educational events, hire speakers to come into their local communities to help with the officers to actually connect with those families in their local communities. And then from the individual perspective, uh, it's it, it, it's really, really important that when you are interacting with a first responder to make sure that you are just not, not doing anything that seems rash at the time. And what I mean by that is that I, I've kind of had a debate in, in my head for quite a few years about these cards that we're seeing these individuals who are on, on the spectrum have, because I'm worried, especially in Black and Hispanic communities, especially, that if somebody tries to, if, for example, one of the kids I'm working with is driving a car and is wanting to pull out the car to tell people that he's a person with autism and he has these challenges, if a police officer will consider that as another avenue and something unfortunate happening because of that. So I, I think when it comes to that, it's important to role play with a loved one and realize that uh, the importance of keeping your hands side by side and then also making sure that if they ask you any question, even if you're not directly looking them in the eyes, just try to answer as best you can and concisely as you can as well and mention that you are, are indeed on the spectrum. We are, I think, like every community, seeing a real increase in mental health challenges and a real lack of resources, um, not enough counselors, not enough crisis programs. Um, people even have not been able to get into um, inpatient treatment because some of our mental our mental health providers have said, nope, that's your autism. That's not uh, a mental health problem. So. Um, so I guess I had a question about anxiety and anxiety management, but beyond that, I'm, I'm trying to grapple with how to help us expand the network of professionals that feel competent in supporting people with autism who have mental health challenges and also um, just, just create more space for that. Yeah, I mean, this this is an issue and it's, we're, we're just heading into the end of April into May, which will be Mental Health Awareness Month, where I, I think it's important that we realize that even though we're three years out of COVID now, there are so many individuals when they were trying to go back into school who are having severe mental health challenges, not only because of the lack of 
social skills because of being home for months on end, but also at the same time trying to get back to this new normal and dealing with difficult routine uh, transitions. So I, I think it's really important that we're talking to our local governments about providing more counseling services across the sport, not only in our K through 12 schools, but then also our universities and in our workplaces as well. One area that I think we could also do a better job when it comes to these mental health challenges is also providing more sensory friendly uh, areas in our local communities and in our workplaces. And what I mean by that is just providing a sensory room or a quiet room when we give professional development for workplaces, what we also do is we speak with human resources about instituting a quiet room, instituting accommodations that could just help anyone, such as dimmers for individuals who have challenges with fluorescent lights, asking the custodial staff to use uh, cleaning products that have a neutral uh, smell to them for those who have uh, challenges with smells because of their sensory challenges, being able to help these individuals who might be going through a tough time not necessarily have any other challenges associated, especially within our autism community. Yeah, oh, I love that answer. Uh, I think you are right about the more the community becomes comfortable, the better it's gonna be for all of us. And so many of those things are useful to more than just the person with, with disabilities. Uh, a lot of us might need a quiet space once in a while. Got a question from someone that said, uh, do you have any tips for an adult who think they're on the spectrum but can't seem to get an official diagnosis? It seems to be almost impossible as an adult. Yeah, the, the, the first thing is I, I would definitely try to reach out to a local autism affiliate group. I mean, St. Louis Arc would be a great uh, recommendation that I would give, especially if you're based in the local area. But in addition to that, I would, I would definitely recommend looking towards those nonprofits like the Autism Society of America who have 70 affiliate chapters because there, I can't tell you how many of these groups have support programs for teens and adults so they can interact with each other. And that would be a great way to start the conversation towards finding those individuals. I mean, we, I, I've seen a little bit of a transition with doctors being able to give some form of recommendation in some areas, but when it comes to more rural areas, we're still seeing a huge, huge gap, which we need to have conversations about. So try to see if there's an organization within your area, like the Autism Society affiliate chapters or the ARC of the United States, who also have some great affiliate chapters for you to take advantage of, the ARC.org and then AutismSociety.org are the way to go. Great advice. And we do have a few providers here. If you're if you're local, contact the St. Louis ARC. Um, the, there is a waiting list, but um, you should be able to get the answer to what you need. Uh, interesting question from a speech pathologist that's in an elementary school. They want to know if you've experienced a memorable strategy or program for increasing your social skills and ability to interact with peers. Well, in addition to just making sure that those social skills or are, are measurable, this just helps tremendously because when, when we talk about SLPs and OTs, uh, BCBAs, and the entire village of support that a student can receive, documentation is really, really key. So when we're having those abilities to have social skills training in our electives and in our uh, mandatory classes in our schools, it's important to make sure that they're measurable, such as my example of being able to interact with my peers twice a week and mean somebody you know. This just helped add a little bit of a structure, which really, really was memorable to me. It was one of the greatest ways I was able to make friendships when I was growing up. Uh, in addition to that, I, I would definitely recommend trying to push towards more unified programs. Uh, I, I've, I've seen it help tremendously on building on social skills because it leads to more allies, leading to less bullying in our schools, which ultimately I've seen help some individuals feel more comfortable in their own shoes towards wanting to be social. And when I talk about unified programs, I'm talking about things like the Special Olympics Unified Champion School Program at specialolympics.org. I mean, there's some great, great resources out there on how you can start a unified program in your school district. 
because uh, I've seen it do some tremendous things for some kids, especially on building on their social skills. I like the way you're hitting on things that we also offer. So there's Arc United Sports you can look out for as well. I know, shameless um, plugs. I'm your hype uh, You know what I'm can your I say? Man. <laughs> so it, this kind of combines employment and social. We've got a question saying, I'm finding it difficult to keep a job and make friends at work with my diagnosis. Any resources for that? I do think so many people find relationships when they're at work, but there's additional challenges sometimes. Well, one recommendation, which I've been seeing in more bigger companies is as part of a company's employee resource group or diversity, equity, inclusion group, I'm seeing a lot of organizations that are forming that are disability related subgroups that are part of ERG and DEI groups. And we've We've given talks to groups about starting those. I mean, when we just spoke with SMP and JP Morgan during Autism Acceptance Month, both of them had a subgroup as part of their organizations. Again, you're not necessarily going to see this in small parent ran uh, businesses. However, if you are going into a company that has a few thousand employees, we're, we're definitely recommending this more and more as a way of helping people just understand a little bit more, especially in terms of the neurodiverse community, not only the autism community. So that would be one of my recommendations, see, talking to your human resource department about seeing if that's something that might be possible. But in addition to that, I mean, there are some great ideas around just being able to really sit in on any professional development opportunities. If your companies do provide any uh, icebreakers or any retreats, really doing your utmost to make sure that you are attending those to help build and also take a break from your work activities so you could focus simply on those uh, social skills and building on those friendships and relationships. I was thinking about, you really emphasize advocacy and your ability to start speaking up for yourself and, and telling people what you need. And, and I want you to be able to talk to families that have children at different age ranges, maybe early childhood, middle school, high school. What are some of the key things that you th think help build that self-advocacy that parents can help their children with? For, for younger children, I mean, the first thing is talking to them about their diagnosis. Even if they're not developmentally ready, never hide a diagnosis. That's really one key area. If you're involved in supporting, volunteering, or fundraising for any local nonprofits in your areas, seeing if they have any special events where they could potentially build on peer-to-peer -peer interactions with parents of other children who might have similar diagnoses. Uh, that's just... I also recommend that as part of an IEP plan that you talk to your child study team about establishing a peer mentor. It just makes sense. It not only for those with autism, it just makes sense for everybody. Having a six-year-old that I've seen, I've had a six-year-old peer mentor read a book to a five-year-old. That was all the peer mentoring they really did. They had a conversation about the book afterwards and they just had play dates and started building on their rapport where the five-year-old could just look up to the six-year-old. That's just a great idea that doesn't affect the bottom line. It doesn't cost your schools anything to do. It just typically takes an academic advisor 20 to 25 hours every academic year to implement that in their school systems and find the mentors and then find the mentees who actually might need the service. Uh, so, and that's just a great way to help with self-advocacy. The, the next area, when, when we talk about those middle school to high school students, I still see transition IEPs fall through the cracks. We spoke with Adelphi University on Monday, where I told them about a keynote I give at college. It's called, Dude, Where's My IEP? Because I went up to my disability support specialist my first day of college, and I said, hey, if you could hook me up with an IEP, I'll be good. And I never knew about 504 reasonable accommodations. So we need, when we talk about self-advocacy, a transition IEP, in addition to the IEP process, can be a great way of actually putting into their IEPs ways of helping build on self-advocacy. So that's another a great area. And then in, in adulthood, just also finding those peer mentors, finding shadows, whether it be college shadows or job shadows, and then just continuing to build 
on uh, their self-advocacy in that way. We've got some questions about where people might be able to hear you again in the near future. Are the places you've listed here on this slide the best places for them to go and find out where your other engagements are? Yes. So thank you for that uh, comment. Uh, so uh, these are the ways that you could stay in contact with me for uh, all my, I, I typically post all my virtual events uh, on each one of my social media pages. So I also consider uh, you guys following me the greatest compliment. If you have a moment to just follow me on all my social media networks tonight, I would greatly appreciate. In addition, uh, if you do want the PowerPoint slide notes, on that link, there will be a little section. Uh, I consider testimonials the greatest uh, compliment. If you learn something new and potentially want me to uh, speak with their school or a company, I would definitely love to keep the conversation going. Well, we really appreciate everything you've done tonight. And I, I have to say, I'm sitting here thinking about, I'd love to have you come back and just talk about representation in media and not talk about anything else because I, I find that such a fascinating topic. And it's cool to see not only how many people with disabilities are, are actors now that are being recognized and are, are visible to me, but I love to hear that you are behind the scenes making sure they're getting it right. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, thank you so much for being with your, us here tonight. I think it's been super interesting and thanks to everybody that came tonight. If you have additional um, follow-up uh, topics you'd like us to focus on or want us to invite Carrie back to talk about something else sooner than we did this time, uh, message us and let us know. And thanks for being here tonight. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Dr. Magro. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody.